Yeah, lovely words, Naga. Thanks so much. Right, coming up, over two grand gets snatched by scammers every minute. And today we're exposing the red flags to watch out for and how this picture of Sasha the dog helped to save her owner from being conned. Mm. Uh, plus, a year on from contracting sepsis, BBC Radio 2 DJ Tony Blackburn discovers how a groundbreaking test could save countless lives. And from House of Games to Murder Mysteries, Richard Osman shares the motive behind his best-selling books. Welcome to Morning Live on a Friday. One day they're going to catch me doing a little dance. You did your little the Friday I dance did. there, didn't you? I wasn't you? expecting them to come back to us. And there I was. Ooh, I had to stop quickly. <laughs> we love a dance on this show, uh, as does Scam Interceptors Nick Stapleton, Dr. Poonham, and Strictly choreographer, of course, Maria. Uh, loves a dance too. Good to see you. Happy Friday. Happy Hi. Friday. Uh, a story in front of the, uh, the press uh, that we've seen uh, today. It's from uh, Ofcom. Uh, almost a quarter of kids aged five to seven have smartphones new research Gosh. out here like you can see the parents sort of grimacing <laughs> nick yes. you've got your is that your scam face what face is, it's, it's my concern face yeah I say get and I, I just found that quite shocking and it also just leads me to something that i've been talking about for a long time which is i think that we really need to start teaching tech literacy and scam literacy and financial literacy in schools mm -hmm. just to make sure that future generations of kids are much better protected against the kinds of scams that unfortunately lots of us fall for every single day yeah, yeah. yeah. it's a yeah. battle to keep your kids off phones as it is try and hold off from giving them a phone in the first place yeah. as long as possible um i know there's the phrase uh, screenagers. Uh, I know there's that phrase because when I'm then on my phone, my kids call me a scraddled. <laughs> uh, doesn't work quite as well, but still, I'm like, okay, and I put the phone. They're making there. the yeah, point. Yeah. You, you got a ten-year-old, but you got. I've got a three year old. Yeah. So, I mean, a couple of years. Well, absolutely. She's about to turn four. I mean, I remember even during lockdown, you know, where the only way that kids could connect with their peers was through their screens and, and the amount of anxiety and actual, you know, concern that that caused for the amount of screen time and lack of social connection. And I just think at that stage, what I want for my children, what's healthiest is for them actually to be socialising and connecting oh, with their really? friends. And, yeah. and I think it's going to come. We can't avoid it. But for as long as possible, let us just minimise and safeguarding is also an issue. We sound yeah. like boring adults. But, uh, well, also, we've got to be careful as well. We've got to put our phones down in front of yes, our kids that's as well. What you preach, there's you a know? lot of that going on where you're like, oh, you've got to be <laughs> present as well. That's fair. Um, now, coming up, it's the so-called weight loss jab. Loads of us have heard mm. all about, but perhaps we don't know the dangers. Uh, there's headlines saying drug Ozempic has been linked to 20 deaths. Uh, today, Poonam, you're going to explain the truth. Is that right? Yeah, it's quite a scary headline. And when I see headlines like that, it immediately worries me about whether my patients or somebody that is on a Zempic has taken this, read the headline and then gone, I'm just going to suddenly stop it, which is a concern and you absolutely mustn't do that. So today I'm going to go through a Zempic, what the benefits of it are, explain this headline and also talk about weight loss jabs. And I'm pleased you're wearing your special debunking dress today. Uh, the new Hollywood DIY oat Zempic uh, is some sort of weird dieting trend. You're going to be talking yes. about that as well. It's a nutritional trend that's taken the internet by storm where thousands of people have been claiming that when they've taken the old scent pick challenge that they've lost lots of weight over a short period of time. So I'm going to talk about this, tell you how to make it and whether there's actually any truth to it. Good. Our food menu today is very varied, as we'll explain in just a second. Yes. But also today, our gardener, Mark Lane, is down the road at the RHS Urban Show at around 5 to 10 this morning. Mark's given our outdoor spaces some spring spiration. Yes. Mark, good morning. What have you got for us? Good morning, yes, why don't you join me a little bit later where I'll be talking about successional planting and, of course, the wonderful bulb lasagna. Of course. Oh, well, he looks very that. urban himself, doesn't he? Very cool. Today, yeah, it is very cool. Do you mean he looks cool? He's always stubble. cool, he's Mark. He's got his hair up, he's ready to go. Has he got designer stubble? I think he has. Very yeah. smart. He said get... he was modern as in a getting. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, plus, we're exploring the growing pressures of producing food. The global population is set to hit 10 billion people in 25 years. Around 10 past 10, former, uh, not former pop star, farmer, oh, and he's still a pop star, <laughs> JB Gill, is, he'll be like, what? has been discovering how eating crickets could be a sustainable answer. 
put in a whole new meaning to the term grub. I thought you were doing like um, like a northern accent then, that farm a pop Far star. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just I ended his pop career live on telly. <laughs> JB, sorry, JB, you're still a pop star, it's fine. Yeah. Um, Quite topical, that, though, isn't it? The sustainable loads, food, yeah. Loads of this, but how do you fancy a lab-grown pork fat sausage? It's the, the birth of the new banger. The yes. Thing. Yeah, I'm not sure I do. Well, apparently all the flavour... I mean, I told the pig farmers, but a lot of the flavour from sausages, you can get it from the fat, so they're trying to grow the fat in labs and then mix it with other bits and bobs mm. and make sausages out of them without harming any... Any little piggies? We don't have that, but we do have some crickets uh, on the show. Oh, for, yes. Oh, yeah. Um, at the 10.15, we're celebrating... Poonam is so excited. She's really up for the crickets. <gasps> at 10.15, we're celebrating BBC Two's 60th birthday, uh, finding out which classics from the 80s and 90s you can re-watch this weekend. Plus, we'll be reminiscing with uh, actor uh, Nina Wadia about why she received aubergines in the post whilst filming <laughs> comedy classic, uh, Goodness Gracious Me. I love an aubergine. And she sent us Earls into the weekend in style with today's Strictly Fitness with some Paso Doble moves. Is that right, Maria? Yes, you know what? I had a great time this week with all of our Paso yeah, moves. That's true. I think it was very fun. Um, on Monday, we learned the very fierce classic stomp from Joe and Diane's routine. There it is right there. Then we moved on to those elegant and very delicate butterfly arms from our very own Helen. We had our sweeps that Ellie is showing us right now. And of course, we finished off yesterday with that strong arm move from John in his beautiful routine. And we're gonna go through that at the end of the show. Powerful stuff, isn't it? Uh, we're gonna be stepping on some scammers' toes now, hopefully, to help you understand their latest tactics. Uh, Nick's been uh, rifling through the uh, Morning Live inbox to share scams you've reported to us and then explain how they actually uh, work. We're starting today, Nick, with Amy, um, about an order she never placed. Uh, what's this story about? So this is an interesting one. She, she got this email and it, it doesn't really say very much other than thank you for your order. There's no mention of a company name or anything like that. Um, but there's some red flags straight away. So I would say that obviously any email you're getting completely out of the blue that is coming from a Gmail account, as this one does, um, certainly probably not going to be legitimate if it's claiming that it's about something like a, you know an order for a company. It also doesn't address her by name at all, and, and the language, I would say, is a little bit unusual. Hi there. But, yeah, this is not really professional stuff, is it, Geth? It's no. not, some, not certainly what we'd expect from a professional company. But the real bit of the scam comes in the, invo the attachment, sorry, which is an, an, a fake PayPal invoice. And it says that she's essentially bought an iPhone for £700 and that if it wasn't her, she needs to flag that to them. And there's some text here which is key, I think. It says, if you're convinced that you have not completed this transaction, please contact us within the next 12 hours at this number, notifying us about the circumstances. We will return the funds to your account within six hours of reporting after verification. Pressure of time. Yeah, I mean, it's just it's, it's putting you under that pressure straight away and making you think, oh, there's something I need to do here. There's some action I need to take, which is absolute scammer 101. And under the terms and conditions, it goes even further. And it says, if no response is received in the time frame, then we will be forced to charge you the full amount. Now, again, that's just not language that a, that a real professional organisation is going to use. It's very kind of, it's very cruel, very mean, making you go, oh gosh, I'm going to be charged money. That's that's not fair. So. It's important to point out that what, what they want you to do here is to call the number that they're giving you. And there's a few reasons that they, they might be doing that. And Amy didn't do it. And the number is no longer in service, so we couldn't test it ourselves. But I, I know about these kinds of scams, and I, I theorise that one of these will be what they're trying. It could be phishing, so they might be getting you to call up so they can take some personal info off you that they then use further down the line to try and scam you. Um, it could be that when you call up, they will actually impersonate the anti-fraud team of PayPal and they'll try and persuade you to move money somewhere. So they'll say, for example, oh, you see, that £700 transaction means your account's compromised. We're going to need to transfer your money to a safe account that we've set up until such time as this investigation is complete. <sighs> Obviously, if you do that, you're not going to see your money again. It's not going to a safe account They're at all. Don't ever be transferring. Really horrible. Horrible. How do they sleep at night? I know, it's, it's proper horrible. social engineering. Really, yeah. really cruel. Um, and the, the last possibility is that they might say, for example, oh, will you download this piece of remote access software onto your device so we can help you fix this problem? 
And that will essentially mean that they can see your device's screen. They might even be able to control it using one of these perfectly legitimate apps that scammers like to abuse. So please don't download anything that someone caught, you know, that you're speaking to over the phone like this tells you to. This is a major red flag. And if you have downloaded something, hang up disconnect your Wi-Fi and remove any apps from your phone or your computer that they've told you to download. Um, lastly, I'd just say if you do get an email like this, try not to open the attachments. Mm -hmm. Please don't be like clicking on links and going through to, to unsolicited to websites from these kind of unsolicited emails. Um, forward them instead to report at phishing.gov.uk, which is the government's tracking service for this kind of thing. Help contribute to evidence, help contribute to our knowledge of how many scams there are out there, and then delete that thing. OK. I found really helpful looking at the email as the first thing, where the email has come mm. from, because yeah. it's often yeah. such a gobbledygook email, isn't it? You think that's not official and it just, you know, really helps. But that's quite right, Sarah. If After the at sign, if it's not a website of an official company yeah. that you're expecting it to be, then it's going to be a scam email, 100%. it's a 100%. scam right yeah. away. Uh, next, uh, we have Brian, who came across a celebrity investment scam. Yeah, so the, the, this kind of thing is really common at the moment, and it's apparently trebled on social media between 2019 and 2022. And essentially, it will be something like, uh, in his case, it was ITV's political news journalist Robert Peston and money-saving expert Martin Lewis saying, endorsing something, basically, saying, if you invest in this, you'll, you'll watch your money grow. And we previously spoke to Zoe Ball, I remember when I was here, about the one that happened to her, which is really, really dreadful, and it's really horrible if this is happening in your name. Horrible, of course, also for the victims who then see some, a, a friendly face and think, yeah, brilliant, I can trust that person, I'll, I'll do this. Now, just remember that these will often also use a reputable source alongside that face. So, for example, BBC News website or something like that. Now. Here's the thing, BBC will never endorse a specific investment. That is just not a thing that this organisation will do at all. Um, so what you can do is you can search for whatever article it is that you're seeing on social media advertising this celebrity endorsement scam um, and see if you can find it on the actual website of whatever source it is that it claims to be. So you can also check the celebrity's actual verified account because, of course, most people who are famous faces will have a verified account on social media and most of them, if they are actually endorsing something, will have posted on it about it on their verified yeah, account. Yeah, yeah. So go on there and have a look. If it's not there, again, massive red flag. Other ones, I would say, sensationalised language, things implying kind of scandal or secrets. Um, we've actually made a fake ad of our own, um, which is me, and I'm selling, telling people how to earn £1,000 a day without getting scammed. And it also says that I'm in some kind of trouble because I've revealed a secret. It's just that sort of salacious language which is going to get you to go, oh, this sounds a bit interesting. Or, maybe, maybe I want to see what that is. It's just a lure. And the thing I would say about all of these investment scams is bear this in mind. If I really had the key to financial freedom, why would I need to sell you something? Yeah. Why would I need to sell you an yeah. investment opportunity or a yeah. training course or whatever it is? I'm already financially free. Yeah. So, so why would I need to bother? Just think about that when you see these kinds of things. Uh, Brian gave his mobile number, um, he, but if the last two weeks he's just been inundated, hundreds of spa uh, scam calls. How can he stop that? He's reported them as spam. What else can he do and he's blocked them? Yeah, so that's, that's great and it's very good that he's doing that. The best thing I would say he can do is just to tell these people he knows it's a scam when they ring him up. The more you tell scam callers that you know something is a scam, the more times your number is going to be removed from their lists because what they want is people who are pliant to these things, people who might get tricked and people who will pay out. Those are the people who will keep getting repeated calls and calls and calls and calls and calls. If you say to a scammer, I know this is a scam, leave me alone, they will delete your number off their list and at least that call centre and whoever they sell on their data to will not be calling you again. OK. Um, finally, tell us about Fiona and the unlikely hero in this story. Yes, I, I've, I found this absolutely fascinating. So Fiona got this message from a romance scammer who said it was a, claiming to be an Amer American army medic and... It's, it said that they'd seen her profile photo on Facebook and that they thought she looked lovely and they'd get on well, which is a very common opening gambit from a romance scammer. Um, she quickly realised that this might be a scam because this is her profile photo. Yes. <laughs> oh, <laughs> cute. That is her dog, Sasha. Um, so I don't think this scammer was particularly doing much due diligence before he was contacting people. Or totally, maybe he's a big fan of canines. Yeah. <laughs> Sasha's got lovely eyes, to be fair. <laughs> yeah. uh, great, yeah. thanks so much, Nick. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Brilliant stuff, as always. Keep sending us uh, any scams you spot so we can help stop you falling foul from the fraudsters. Just drop us a line in all the usual ways. You can email us at morninglive at bbc.co.uk. 
Uh, now then, we're getting an update from my fellow Radio 2 pal and all-round absolute legend, Mr Tony Blackburn now. Uh, a year ago, he contracted the deadly infection sepsis and in an exclusive film for Morning Live last September, he met two fellow survivors. Now he's finding out about a game-changing new test that could be the difference between life and death. Our bodies are built to fight infections. When it does, our immune system can go into overdrive, attacking body tissues and organs. It's a condition called sepsis, also known as blood poisoning, and in just a single year, the cause of 48,000 deaths. Last year, sepsis made me seriously ill, and like many of us, I'd never even heard of it. So last September, here on Morning Live, I went to meet two people to find out how sepsis had affected them. Mark from Essex and Beth from Hampshire. Though I do remember asking the doctor, am I going to die from this? And he looked at me straight in the eyes and he said to me, you're not out of the woods yet. I had complete renal failure, respiratory failure. And then you were told you had to have an amputation yeah, I mean, it's one of the most surreal moments of my life. Mm. If I'd have thought that having a pain in my side would end up in yeah. loss of all four limbs in various guises, never in a million years. It's seven months since I met Mark and Beth, and they're both continuing their recovery. But since that filming, we found out there's a new way to diagnose sepsis, and I want to find out about it. Dr. Andrew Retcher from Guy's and St. Thomas's Hospital in London is no stranger to sepsis. We actually have six intensive care units. We admit somewhere between 3,500 and 4,000 patients a year, wow. of which about 1,000 will have sepsis. Mm. So we see sepsis every single day. Speedy diagnosis is key because the longer it takes to detect sepsis, the more devastating its effects can be. One of the issues is to spot when someone's deteriorating, and then to escalate that and to call for help. But at present, there's no single test which can diagnose sepsis. Dr. Retters, one of the team behind a test which is able to identify which patients are at a higher risk of developing sepsis when they arrive in hospital. There's a very exciting development, isn't there? A so possible exciting there's development. There's a possible exciting development. Yes. So we have started work with a new test. We hope it will help us predict someone who's going to go and develop sepsis and also be a marker of how severe their sepsis is. Using a simple sample of patient's blood, the test aims to identify a protein associated with sepsis that is created by the body's immune system. The higher the level of that protein, the greater the sepsis risk. It's the spotting that's the important bit, isn't it? Because every hour that goes on, it yep. can be really critical, can't yep. it? For every hour antibiotics are delayed in someone who's got a severe sepsis, that their mortality increases by about 8%. The blood samples arrive here in the hospital's lab, to be tested as part of the project. This is our new magic machine. It's looking to detect the presence of neutrophil extracellular traps. Mm -hmm. and it's picking up a very specific protein in those neutrophil extracellular traps. Something called your H3.1 protein is what it's picking up, yeah. and that's what, that's what we're detecting. You're very clever. I don't understand a <laughs> word of what you're saying. <laughs> the science might be complex, but the benefits this test could have for patients are crystal clear. What we hope is that this is just an extra test, just helps identify someone who yeah. actually doesn't look too bad, but then this blood test actually reveals they're a bit sicker than you initially appreciated. Speed up the recognition yes. and speed up the escalation and asking for help, yeah. So a really exciting development, this. It is, yes. It? Yeah. It's going to save, potentially, a lot of lives. I hope so, absolutely. Innovations like these could make a huge difference, according to the CEO of charity The Sepsis Trust, Dr. Ron Daniels. We have to bear in mind this is a condition that affects as many people as heart attacks. It claims more lives than some of the big cancers that we, that we know and fear. Sepsis can arise in any person of any age. It can arise as a consequence of any infection anywhere in or on the body. And so people don't come in sort of waving a flag saying, I, I've got sepsis. So if we can identify it reliably and quickly, that could be game changing. At present, sepsis alone costs the NHS around £2.8 billion each year. 
So adding new tests like this to the system could stretch budgets even further. As with everything, and it's awful to be thinking about this when we're talking about saving lives, there's going to be a cost involved with this product. And what we have to do is to ensure that our NHS is prepared to invest, treat it quickly, stop people getting as sick as to need intensive care, then we can improve the quality of life to survivors. Andrew and the rest of the team at Guy's and St Thomas's are doing everything in their power to develop this groundbreaking test. I can tell Andrew that you're a wonderful doctor and you. you have got your heart and soul in this. What would it feel like when this actually comes out and everybody is using it, for you personally? It would be absolutely wonderful mm. to have something new for sepsis. Sepsis is a huge public health problem and just to be a tiny part in making it better would be wonderful. That would be amazing. What I've seen today shows me there really is a reason for optimism, something that hasn't always been the case with sepsis. So let's hope this test is successful because then it could be available for all of us very, very soon. I think we're always just keeping our fingers crossed, aren't we, with new advancements in yeah. medical technology to help. Something like sepsis would be brilliant, wouldn't yeah. it, as Tony was saying? Absolutely, absolutely. I like the way Tony told us, like, you're really great. I don't know what oh, you're yeah. on about, though. Not clear what he said. <laughs> <laughs> you're really clever. Keep doing oh, what you're doing, yeah. Such a lovely bloke. Right, we are staying with uh, health stuff now, tackling the truth behind uh, some worrying headlines. This one says weight loss jabs like Ozempic have been linked to 20 deaths in Britain, including a person in their 30s. Dr Poonam, frightening headlines, especially if there's some people who were taking this medicine. Yeah. Uh, so what's going on? Yes, it's always important to go beyond the headline and look at the actual facts. And the very first thing to say is that Zempic is not actually a licensed weight loss drug in the first place. So we'll talk about that more in a moment. But if you are on a Zempic and it's solely for the purpose of weight loss and it begs the question how did you get that and where did you get it from and who's regulating and monitoring that because like all drugs Ozempic too has side effects now we can people are always encouraged to log and report any adverse side effects you can do that on a system called the yellow card scheme this is online accessible to everyone and what we found was that from 2019 there were 20 reports of fatal adverse side effects from Ozempic um, but since then what we have learned is that actually it, there's no proven link that actually it was a Zempic that caused these fatal adverse effects. So that's really reassuring and hopefully if anybody is on this and is concerned about it then that offers some reassurance and you know if you do develop any side effects particularly if you're on a Zempic then report that to your doctor and we would then look into that for you. But I think the bigger take home is that you know you shouldn't be purchasing drugs like a Zempic online. Um, it's very important that you get that from a reputable doctor or a weight management service um, and if you're eligible, you absolutely will get that, but it's not for weight loss. Yeah, because we've all heard about it because it's been in the papers and yeah. it's been like people in LA or on a Zempic just to lose a few pounds, mm. but it, it's not actually for that. No, and I think that's the biggest misconception is that people think Ozempic is the weight loss drug. It was never created for that purpose. It was created, it's been approved, and it's licensed only for the management of type 2 diabetes, and it helps to regulate and manage that blood glucose level. Um, and that's what a lot of people don't know. Now, where does the weight loss element come from is the active ingredient within Ozempic actually has other benefits in that it can help to suppress your appetite and it can also slow down the movement of food along your gut. So you essentially feel fuller for longer. And that was seen in people that were type 2 diabetics. And it's that weight loss element that has since then been sensationalised. It's received a lot of hype in the media. Celebrities have endorsed it. Um, and through all of that, what's happened is that lots of people have then been getting it off label. So they've been getting it from private clinics, buying it online. And it's, it's come at the detriment of those that actually have type 2 diabetes, who there's a global shortage of this drug. So people that actually really need it are not able to get it because we're use, misusing the Ozempics. Now, if you are struggling with weight management and you meet the criteria, there are two drugs available on the NHS that we can prescribe for that. One's called Vigovi, the other is Sixenda. But with that, again, there's a strict criteria 
for who is eligible. So things like if you have a BMI that's over 30 or if you have a weight related condition. So if you are overweight and uh, uh, high uncontrolled blood pressure, at risk of heart disease, high cholesterol, then at that point we would consider it. And even with that, we would refer you to a specialist weight management service. And it isn't just that we give you the drug and off you go. It comes with a whole host of lifestyle changes um, because this is a long term investment for yourself. So in things like exercise, diet, we were talking yesterday about couch to 5k, all these things are very important. But alongside that, we monitor it very carefully. It, is it me? It seems crazy that, that some people are wary of having a flu jab or a COVID jab, but they're willing to buy something online and yeah, it's, you know, it's like in a little it. pen yeah. form. Yeah, and absolutely. Jab. And it is frightening. You don't know what it is. You don't know what you're getting, and that's the dangers of getting this stuff online. Yeah. And as you say, you know, people can get carried away with other things. But when it comes to very vital vaccines, they're, they're worried about it. Yeah. With something like this, the, the demand goes up. And, yeah. and Nick, we'll bring you in on this. I'd imagine, you know, the scammers see this, they see an opportunity, and there's lots of counterfeit versions of weight loss drugs now flooding the market. Of course, and the danger with that is that you're buying from somewhere where it's not it's not managed. There's no healthcare professional involved, so you can just take it in whatever way you want. It's not supervised at all. And on top of that, do you really know what you're getting? Is it really what it claims to be? Are you going to be putting something in your body that's you know not necessarily what it actually says on the tin? That would really worry me. So there was a BBC investigation last year that found all kinds of unregulated sellers offering semaglutide as a medicine without any kind of prescription online. It was also being offered in beauty salons in Manchester and in Liverpool. And on receiving the product, people found that it didn't always contain the level of the drug that it claimed to, and often actually that there wasn't any at all. And obviously, if it's not what it's claiming to be, then then what is it? That That is very, very worrying. So the MRHA, which is the Medicines and Healthcare Regulatory Agency, last year also seized hundreds of fake Ozempic pens. And the consumer group, which found that there were websites out there related to Ozempic that were actually being used for phishing scams. So the danger here to you is, is twofold. You're putting your health at risk by potentially injecting something that is nefarious into your body or at least isn't what you're expecting it to be. And on top of that, you might actually get scammed. So I'd be really, really cautious. Yeah. As a GP, you're hearing that thinking it's just the worst possible scenario, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's a huge worry and we get people that have taken it and have, have, have ended up or they don't actually know what they've had but they've developed lots of adverse side effects and you can't then verify, you know, was it the active drug that you've taken, mm. what actually have you taken um, so I think you've got to be really careful like unless it's coming from an actual healthcare professional do not touch it with a barge pole. Yeah, okay, thanks Poonam. On the back of Ozempic and all the interest around that, there's Oat oh, yeah. Ozempic yeah. which is something that has been seen a lot on social media on TikTok, Ooh. is that right? Yeah, it's a nutritional trend that went viral um, and Oatsempic, it's got actually nothing to do with the active drug, um, the active ingredient that's in the drug Ozempic. So what this is, essentially, it is a drink that you make up, a cup of water, half a cup of oats, um, with half a lime squeezed into that, blitz that up and you do the Oatsempic challenge and lots of people, thousands of people have tried it on social media and reported that they lost dramatic amounts of weight over a short period of time. Now that causes alarm. I love oats. Oats are a fantastic source of energy. They are a great source of fibre. Mm. And by all means, if you want to have an oaty drink like this in the morning, fine. But it's absolutely no reason to be swapping that for a balanced meal. Mm. And you've got to think about the long term implications. So by all means, have a hearty bowl of porridge, porridge instead. Yeah. But there's absolutely no claims to back this up. So a, a balanced meal. So something balanced. high in iron, something high in calcium, high in protein. You <laughs> absolutely... <laughs> have and try no matter what it was. I know what it's going what, somewhere else. Know, right. know Excellent. <laughs> We've got a bit of breakfast for you. You, you have to eat it because it's good for you. Uh, if you've got any questions for, for Dr Poonam uh, or Nick or any of the experts on the show uh, today, then get in touch in all the usual ways. A reminder of our email address, uh, morninglive at bbc.co.uk. We'll plat sawdust if we get Poonam to eat a cricket today on the <laughs> telly. <laughs> I really will. Uh, no, don't forget, you can send any questions via WhatsApp. You can do that by adding the number 0800 032 11 double O to your phone book. Save us there in your phone book. You don't have to do it once. Save us as the best show on telly, if you like. It's up to you. Uh, or you can scan the QR code on the bottom of the screen now and get in touch. We love all your questions. Uh, remember, it's just for messages, though. It won't work if you try to call it. We do get now, all kinds of different messages. Do we? Yeah, yes, we love it. We love it. Uh, now, something else. Uh, thanks very much, Poonam. Uh, we want to hear from you about, of course, is whether... Uh, 
your garden. What state is it in? Have you managed to get it ready for spring? If you've not, nobody panic. We've got help. Not where Mark Lane, our gardener, <laughs> is at the helm. He's on hand with some inspiration. He's uh, down the road today at the RHS Urban Show here in Manchester. Uh, morning, Mark. What are you up to? Hello, yes, here I am at the Urban Show. There's a real buzz. This is the first indoor large-scale flower show for the RHS. Now, the first day was yesterday, and you may have seen some coverage on our sister programme, The One Show, last night. The buzz, there are thousands of people coming through the doors, and thousands more are expected today to come and see how this historic former railway station has been transformed into a gardener's paradise. We've got inspirational exhibits, workshops, and, of course, lots of plants. And they've even brought show gardens here, but brought them inside. And if we head over here, we can meet one of the brilliant designers, Amanda Grimes, who's done just that. Hello, Amanda. Hi, Mark. Now, the last time we saw each other was at RHS Hampton Port Flower Show, where you brought us the Punk Rockery Garden. It was. The original Punk Rockery was all about inspiring new gardeners to just get out there and have a go. It was in between the lockdowns, and there were lots of people who didn't have the knowledge or the experience to create a garden, but wanted to get out there and do something. So that was all about literally going up out there, smashing up the patio and planting into it. And you've now brought that back to the internal space, uh, but with a slight twist, haven't you? Yeah, we wanted to bring it... The RHS asked me to bring it to Manchester, and when I remembered about the whole 1976 Sex Pistols gig in Manchester, which yep. kicked off the whole new wave music scene, I just thought that was just a perfect link. So I've still um, kept pretty much the original concept. The plants are very drought-tolerant, but they can stand a bit of a downpour because obviously it is Manchester. Um, <laughs> but as long as they get good drainage around their roots, yep. um, they'll be fine. And that's what the gravel, uh, the rubble does. Yeah. yeah, and you've also used reclaimed materials as well, haven't you? We have. So there's a reclaimed just rubble that has come out of gardens and building sites. I mean, given how Manchester's being rebuilt at the moment, there's plenty of that around. Um, but it's just showing that you can use things like a dustbin lid for a bird bath. You yep. can use um, old edgings to just to recreate a garden. You don't have to go and spend a lot of money to go and to, to recreate this thing. And you've also been really busy, haven't you? Because you've also created another garden. Should we go and have a yep, look? Yeah, they kept me busy. So tell me, what is the inspiration for this garden? We wanted to keep the whole music scene reference. Yep. And anybody who knows will be able to tell that this very much comes from, like, the Hacienda um, ethic, you know, aesthetic. Um, but it was also about celebrating Manchester now. It's such a buzzy, lively city at night. And we wanted to translate that into a horticultural context. And it was all about keeping the party going. So you'd have something in your garden to look at all year round. So you've got successional planting, is that right? Yeah, we just got stuff that looks good at different times of year or does more than one thing. So you've got things like the pine, which will keep structure all the way through winter. Yep. You've got my favourite grasses, the Kerex, yeah. which stay a beautiful orangey colour yeah. all through winter. You've got things like geum and the salvia that if you give them a bit of a trim, they will keep on rewarding you with flowers. And the amelanchia, which, you know, that has lovely white flowers in spring. It has uh, berries in June, and then it has fantastic autumn colour as well. Yeah, and of course you've got gorgeous euphorbias with those lime green leaves, which mm. I absolutely love. Now, if you've got a smaller space, you can still keep that successional planting going by doing what's called a bulb lasagna. Get your planter, put your bulbs in different layers, and then that way they'll come up and give you flowers at different times of the year. Put a specimen plant in the top, surround it by some bedding plants, and hey, presto, you've got colour and interest for 12 months. Thank you so much, Amanda. That's been brilliant. Well, I'm going to have a smooch around here, but uh, why don't you come and join us a little bit later, because I'll be answering your gardening questions. Lovely. Thanks, Mark. A smooch. <laughs> a little smooch. Of a... The Bob Lasagna, what a great name. I love that. Yeah, I poked up at the mention of lasagna. Yeah. I was like, you what? need some help with your indoor plants as well. Placement. Oh, it's like having a new pet. Basically, I thought I would choose what room I wanted to put a plant in, but instead the plant decides where mm -hmm. it wants to be. Yeah. I'm moving my plants around the house, giving them a holiday every few days till you, they look happier. It's you complicated. need some advice. I do. And Mark will have it in about 35 Good. minutes' time. Uh, it'll also uh, tell you which house plants will bring colour to your home. We've talked about a few there. Mm -hmm. And which to avoid if you have pets. He's got the lot a bit later. Yeah, absolutely. Still to come then. A growing population means there's more pressure to produce more grub. Pop star and farmer Jay 
B Gill learns why chefs are substituting crickets for beef and discovers why the thought of eating insects really does bug some people. That's in around 10 minutes' time. Yeah, look at the face of Dr Peoples when I say crickets for breakfast. No, no, there you no. go. Uh, plus, at 10.15, we're celebrating six years of BBC Two by finding out which classic comedies from the 80s and 90s you can enjoy this weekend. And straight after that, 10.25, Richard Osman, creator of BBC Quiz Show Pointless, which started life actually on BBC Two, shares why a sleepy suburb inspired his smash hit murder mystery novels. Before all of that, it's time for Maria to remind us of this week's Strictly Fitness moves before we put them together at the end of the show. Uh, it's been a Paso of a week. It's been a fabulous Paso week. Let's remember what we learned this Monday. So we had our fierce Paso stomp, shown here by Joe and Diane, right there. And then we had our beautiful butterfly hands, from our very own Helen. And then we had our sweeps from Ellie. We can see her doing it right there, very powerful move. And then we finished off with John's gorgeous round movement with the arms and to the other side. So we're gonna be doing that at the end of the show. Lovely stuff, thanks so much, Maria. And we are gonna help you to put your best foot forward now when it comes to legal issues. Whether you need help with a house move or divorce advice, legal fees can come with a bit of a hefty price tag. Yes, yeah, Solicitor Aisha Niar is here to share her tips so people can maximize every minute of appointments. Um, Aisha, there are lots of reasons people need legal advice, isn't there? There are, there are various reasons. Now, you definitely need a solicitor for reserved legal activities. So they are things like having an oath sweared or probate activities. But the reality is a lot of the jobs that solicitors do, you can actually do them yourself. So you can take a case to court if you want, you can do your own divorce, you can write a will yourself as well if you want. But as I often say to my clients, you can use a solicitor or you can do it on your own. Doing it on your own is a bit like when you want to get from A to B. You can open your door with a map and you can leave and you can wander the streets, stopping people on the way. You don't really know where you're going. You might get lost on the way, you're stressed out. Hopefully you'll eventually get there, but you may get there the long way round or you may not get there, but fingers crossed you will. Or you can sit back and you can phone a taxi and that'll come <laughs> right outside your house and it'll take you from A to B with minimum force, minimum stress. The taxi driver hopefully knows where he's going and you're there. But the downside of that is, as we all know, it will cost you to get there. So there are options available if you can't afford it. The good point with using a solicitor is they know their job. So they are experienced in what they do and they will get it right for you. They know the rules and regulations involved. It's a little bit like, I gave the example, you can draft your own will. There are quite strict rules with will drafting. It's not just about writing it on a piece of paper. So, for example, your will has to be witnessed by two individual people and they can't be beneficiaries of your will. So, if, for example, you get it wrong and one of your beneficiaries wit witnesses it, the will is completely invalid. So, in these circumstances, if you don't know what you're doing, it may well be worth using a solicitor because in the long run, although it's cost you, it saved you a lot of future problems. Mm. Could you do your own will and then get it checked by a solicitor to make sure it's all above board and seems OK? Yeah, absolutely. You Save can money. pretty much do anything. And again, I often give my clients the analogy, a little bit like a train track. You can come to a solicitor for a short period of time, we'll get your train mm. on the right track and we'll get you moving. And then you may, at different stations, stop get off, ask for a bit of advice and get back on. So you can work with your solicitor to, if you are on a mm. limited budget, to get the job done. I think it's really important that you explain that to your solicitor at the outset. So if you figured out the level of service that you want, what would you then expect in terms of service back from a solicitor? Well, a good solicitor will tell you what your legal rights are and they will explain your options to you and then they will advise you on the best fit for your particular case. So again, for example, if you've got a building dispute, a dispute with your builder, you may want to go all guns blazing and think that you can issue proceedings, but that might not be the right answer. You may want to go down the mediation route. You may want to try and get your builder back in to try and do the job. So a good solicitor will explain where your legal, what your legal rights are and give you options as to how you go forward. A good solicitor will also explain the cost, which is obviously very, very important, of doing what you want to do. They will give you a, a out cost 
outset, at the very outset, but they will also tell you and give you regular updates as the case progresses to see whether it's cost effective to actually go the full way. Clear communication is another skill that every good solicitor needs to have. So they should be able to explain things very clearly to you so you completely understand what they are doing and why and you're fully aware of that. Um, Confidentiality, anything you tell your solicitor, they have to keep that in confidence unless they have to reveal it for, by reason of law. But generally speaking, anything you tell your solicitor, it's, it's kept in absolute confidence. If you're unhappy with the way your solicitor has dealt with your case in any way, then you can invoke their complaints procedure. And if you're still not happy with the outcome, you can take it to the legal ombudsman. But I think it's really important to say that at the outset, choose a solicitor carefully and choose one that will work with you to get the result that you want. Use a specialist. So we don't know everything mm -hmm. as solicitors. So if, for example, you're going through a divorce, go to a family specialist. If you've got an insolvency issue, then go to an insolvency practitioner. So choose the right solicitor for the type of case that and you don't need. be scared to ask about finance and about you know because i was thinking oh do you get charged for every phone call that you make to a solicitor but you can discuss all that at the first appointment can't you of course you can and what we do know as solicitors is we are often a distress service so you're already in trouble yeah. when you're coming to a solicitor so you can be very stressed out yeah. so a good solicitor will alleviate your concerns and work with you to make the whole process as stress-free as possible. Now, I'd say there's two main worries, in my experience, clients have when they come to see us. How long will it take and how much will it cost? And both of those, you should be able to answer very quickly after your first appointment. But when you are choosing a solicitor, make sure you choose the right one. Solicitors like any service that you're paying for, There'll, there'll be a website, there'll be reviews. If there are any red flags, like my solicitor charged double or yeah. um, I got a bad result or they lost my paperwork, all of those red flags then stay well clear. The Solicitors Regulation Authority has a list of all solicitors' names on there and you can choose one from there that will suit your particular case. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it's helpful to get there prepared, isn't it? To What can you take along on your first appointment? Yeah, absolutely. Like any service that you are paying for, especially if you're paying on an hourly rate basis as opposed to a fixed fee, every minute counts so make sure you've got all the information that you need so for example take along all your documents with you you may want to email your solicitor beforehand all your documents ask them what do i need what do i need to bring with me um whatever you take with you make sure you keep a copy of it if you do need to give it to your solicitor as well you can take a friend along with you um you can uh, if you need uh, to disability um adjustments you can ask your solicitor to make sure that they are in place but as i say Make sure you are fully prepared because you're paying for a service and the service that you're paying for, you need to make sure that you get the most out of. OK, Aisha, perfect. Thank you so much. If you have got any legal dilemmas you'd like advice on, do get in touch. Uh, legal Legal Gary Rycroft will be swooping in next Tuesday to answer your questions. Just email morninglive at bbc.co.uk. Aisha, thank you. It's not only legal fees that can burn a hole in your pocket. The soaring price of food might too. And to try to keep up with the growing population, some chefs are putting sustainable dishes on the menu. Yeah, now, bear with me a minute here. Farmer and pop star J.B. Gill has been discovering if crickets are set to become the dish of the day. And I suppose an advantage is if there's six of you sitting down for dinner, at least everyone can have a leg. <laughs> uh, but would you swap your beef burger for a bug burger? I've been a farmer for 12 years, and since JLS took a break in 2013, I now run a small holding in the Kent countryside. My family and I grow apples, cherries and pears, and rear turkeys and pigs, and I've learned a lot about what it takes to get food to your plate. And I've gained an appreciation of the time, effort and resources it takes to do it. In the next 25 years, the world's population will reach nearly 10 billion people. That's a lot of mouths to feed, and the way we currently produce food isn't as efficient as it could be. But some foodie entrepreneurs are looking at changing our diets entirely to help solve our food production problems. This restaurant in North London is serving dishes which give a different meaning to the word grub. Leo, please tell me what we have on these plates. <laughs> right, so you've got some roasted crunchy crickets. As far as I'm concerned, crickets are to be heard and not seen. <laughs> Definitely not eaten. <laughs> well, hopefully we change your mind. OK, well, I'm going to be brave. I'm going to try one. Anyone? Go for it, yeah. Ah. OK. I'm not sure what I was expecting. It's not very salty. 
quite sort of neutral flavour, a bit nutty. So you're getting the purest sort of flavour of the cricket? Wow. Are crickets cheaper to produce? Not yet, uh, <laughs> but we're working on it. They might be pricey for now, but farming crickets has some enormous benefits for the future of our food. Not least, they take up a lot less space. About 20% of all the land on Earth is used to farm livestock. But crickets are farmed up, rather than out. They're just incredibly sustainable. Also, they're farmed vertically, so you're not needing nearly as much uh, space of what you'd use for um, a need for other traditional livestock. They can also be grown pretty much anywhere. These ones are from Cambridgeshire. And per 100 grams, they've got more protein than beef. This roasted cricket here is about 70% protein. That's three times the protein of beef. Uh, they've got more iron than spinach, more calcium than milk. So it's, it, you know, when we talk about superfood, this is what you're looking at. Never in a million years would have considered eating a cricket as a source of protein, but it actually tastes pretty good. There's a cultural history around eating insects. If you go to some of the 80% of countries around the world that eat bugs, crickets you know, are on the menu in many of those, those places. Um, so people are already into the idea of eating them. But also we think they're, they're one of the most tasty. In the kitchen, crickets are being turned into a variety of dishes. Our chef's cooking up a kofta patty uh, okay. that goes into our kofta kebab. We've got a cricket brisket uh, strip or chunk here. The way we make this is with three ingredients, crickets, whole wheat flour and salt. Um, and uh, it's literally a loaf of cricket meat that we then pull apart. It actually does taste surprisingly like beef. It's, it becomes really, you know, quite surprisingly meaty. So that's the patty just coming out of, okay. out of the pan. That's been mixed in uh, with uh, various herbs um, and spices. It's got sort of that sort of Middle Eastern uh, sort of flavour uh, in the kofta kebab. Mm. My heart, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> just because um, of the word cricket, mm. we have this phobia, you know, that is a bug and it's, you know, and I don't really like the noise. Yeah, yeah, I've been all, I'll be in there all over the world, so yes. So what do you think of the taste? I love it. I'm from Colombia, so down there they eat uh, ants. Mm -hmm. It's almost the same thing. She sniffs everything. Yeah, I do. It's all right. I love it. I would actually buy that as a star. I think you should rename it and then call it Cricket. Yeah. <laughs> we have these some people No, not, not really. Give it a French name or something. <laughs> It might be a while before cricket becomes everyone's favourite, but the reaction today seems fairly positive. And it's not just meat production that's changing. In some months, the UK imports around 90% of salad. That's due to our climate, and also partly because it takes so much space to grow on our crowded island. So once again, some producers are looking up for solutions. Kate Hoffman is founder of Grow Up Vertical Farm. Here they grow salad leaves inside, stimulating the plants to grow using special lights. And with several rows on top of each other, it takes up a fraction of the space it would in a field. How do your farming methods differ from traditional methods? Well, on a vertical farm, what we're doing is controlling all parts of the growing and we're creating the perfect conditions for our plants to thrive in. So for these salads, that would be like a Mediterranean spring day every day of the year. So we use LED lighting to provide the light instead of uh, the sun. On our farm, we don't worry about the weather forecast, we create it. I'm thinking about it and I think that's a lot of energy and a lot of cost. <laughs> so just explain how you combat that. We've built our farm next to a renewable energy plant and that means that we have access to low carbon, low cost energy to run the farm. We don't grow with any pesticides and we're very efficient with how we use water and fertilizer. Our salads are ready to eat without needing to be washed and they'll stay fresher for much longer in your fridge so you can cut down on food waste that you might normally find from having to throw away soggy salad. Vertical farming could mean less waste, fewer imports and all year round fresh salad. But while some vertical veg is already on sale in supermarkets, it might be a while until climate-friendly critters appear on our shelves. In the meantime, check the label and see where you're buying your produce from. If you can, buying local is usually much better for the planet, so we can all look forward to a greener future. But the thing that I'm looking forward to most of all when it comes to the future of food production 
is the fact that meat, like cricket, not only look and smell great, but they taste great too. More please. Well, JB reckons they taste good, so mm -hmm. we thought uh, we'd see what you <laughs> would make of them. Here you go, we've got some uh, oh, no. crickets here. Maria, why don't you start? There you go. Thank you. Don't forget, full of iron, more calcium than milk. I'll grab two, no, don't, one. Don't play with your food, Maria. I think you've got oh, to think, you, you know, they just give me the heebie-jeebies. Come, Come on, Come on, you've got to try it. Imagine they're like a land nope. prawn. Think <laughs> land prawn, Feel because we eat prawns and they look funny, me. don't they? A land prawn. It's a land prawn. <laughs> That's Nick Stables from Nick Insectors. Come on, <laughs> let's have a go. I've never had a go. Yeah, it's nice. Are you from, nutty. Have you had them before? Yeah, yeah. No, I can't do it. It's not bad. It's not bad. It's not bad. It's not bad. It's just crunchy. Oh, sorry. It's a future, let's see. It's actually not as bad as I thought. Oh, no, I can't. I can't. I'm seeing. No, no, no. I'm right. The key point is just to not think about about any kind of mice droppings while you're eating them. Oh, that's silly. Thank you very much. That's all right. It's just a bit dry, that's all. Not too bad. Nutty, as you say, yeah. Uh, it's time to dish up some comedy classic from the past 60 years of BBC Two. Now, presenter and radio... Come on, Radio Two DJ OJ Borge is here to run <laughs> us through some classic comedy that we'll see on the telly mm. over the weekend. Yes. Good to see you. You look very fresh. Thank you so much. <laughs> How are you doing, OJ? What time did you get off air of BBC Radio 2? 3 a.m. I came straight from the studio. I've been <laughs> in makeup now for five hours <laughs> to make sure that I look this way. We're fresh. nearly there. Just a bit more, and then you know you look perfect. Thank you. Um, so then, uh, BBC Two is the home to some great stuff. You've been choosing all your favourite bits and bobs, is that right? I have indeed, yeah. Now, BBC One's all right, isn't it? That's fine. <laughs> but BBC Two is where it's at. The reason I say this is it was just, it was just a bit more risque gave all these shows this chance to be a bit more different. Some great shows over the years. My favourites, Red Dwarf, The Fast Show, and to celebrate 60 years, the Diamond Jubilee, of BBC Two, they are showing some of our comedy favourites. Open All Hours is on that list of your favourites, isn't it? Yeah, because it's pure nostalgia. Mm. And do you know what? On my show last night, I actually played the theme tune, and I got all these messages saying, oh, my God, it takes me back. And now, using the magic of television, let's recreate that for you. Oh. Oh, yeah. That lonely trumpet. And it is beautiful, and Ark writes. I mean, it was reminiscent of a time that possibly doesn't exist anymore. You know, the way we shopped now is very much different. Uh, Ronnie Barker, David Jason, one of the great double acts. <laughs> I was just going to let it peter out gently. Oh, okay. Absolutely oh, beautiful. Um, it was wonderful watch. It really, really was. You'll remember. If you remember the till, when they used to go in the till and the till had shut their yeah. fingers in every single time. Now, Saturday's episode is from series one, Beware of the Dog, a schoolboy unconvinced by the Beware of the Dog sign in the front of Arkwright's shop, goes inside to investigate further. How long have you had a dog? I've never seen a dog. Then that's because it moves like a panther. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it in the back in here. In a den cunningly constructed out of baked bean tins, the whole floor is, is strewn with human remains and sends in schoolboys' caps. Whoop, 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 get out, get out! I mean, what a great dog impression that is there from Ronnie Barker. Uh, you can watch that open all hours Saturday, 6.55 on BBC Two. People are going to absolutely love this, aren't they? Yes, it's going to yeah. be such a lovely nostalgia fest. Uh, Miranda, as well, we can expect, is that right? Yep, she is the patron saint of those of us who are maybe a little bit awkward, maybe a little bit too tall, say the wrong thing at the wrong time, I feel very much seen. Um, do you know, I still say this, that the first episode is one of the greatest setups in the history of TV comedy. You watch it 20 seconds, it tells you everything you need to know about it, and that's the episode you can watch on BBC Two. It is Miranda going on her first real date, this is the clip we've got for you, when asked out by our long-time crush, Gary, who she can barely contain herself when she sees him. To say. Oh, yeah, it's a little bit of flatulence there. Miranda, <laughs> played by Miranda, telling us how we should do our flirting. If you want to watch that Saturday, 7.55 on BBC2. Uh, slight tangent, just FYI, it's, it's some aftertaste, that cricket. Oh, no, I didn't, I didn't get any It's still water. this, just like, yeah, down the, yeah. Down, just down the throat. I need bit. to floss. Uh, um, <laughs> now, Butterflies, a beautiful show from the 1970s, starring the brilliant Wendy Craig. It was a huge show in our house. We loved Did it. Did you watch? Because I never watched this. This yes. was one you watched. The, well, you were both saying that earlier, and I think it's your subtle way of saying that you're younger than yeah, I am. So thanks, like, guys. I was really yeah. young when I saw it. <laughs> yeah. You were like, oh, don't remember this. Well, because 45 years 
years later on. I mean, it was one of those shows written by Carla Lane. She did The Live of Bird. She did Bread, fabulous writer of the 70s. Um, it, was, it was iconic at the time because it was a middle-aged suburban housewife. It showed a life, female lead, showed a life that wasn't really shown. 45 years on, I think it still absolutely works, you know. Um, it still hits home, you know, somebody who's midlife, maybe their internal commentary is way more fabulous than the reality of their life. It's, it's bittersweet and brilliant. Um, it became a beloved hit, as you said. It was watched at its peak by 15 million wow. viewers. That was like a quarter of the population watching it. Um, BBC Two is showing the first episode from the series tomorrow. Uh, one of the many comedy themes present throughout the show is Rhea's terrible cooking. A lifelong vegetarian, <laughs> unknown green things on a plate. I'm absolutely all over. Uh, you can watch it Saturday, 7.25 on... BBC Two, yeah, yeah. Uh, as you can with Goodness Gracious Me, which is on Sunday. I'm delighted to say we're joined by Nina Wadia, uh, one of the stars of the show. How lovely to see you, uh, Nina. We were just talking about butterflies there. And Goodness Gracious Me, very much in the same mould of you know, like a real representation, wasn't it? A groundbreaking comedy of its time. Oh, very much so. I mean, at the time, we didn't know it. We were just very happy if people enjoyed the show, to be honest. Um, but I grew up like watching Butterflies. Wendy Craig was one of my absolute heroes. Um, and I got lucky enough to end up in still open all hours, OJ. So that was that was a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, at the time when we did Goodness Gracious Me, we were just excited to have four brown faces on television all at the same time, uh, which I think was a huge thing. And, and BBC Two was very groundbreaking that way and gave us the opportunity to actually have our voices heard. Uh, do you have a favourite sketch that you look <laughs> back on, Nina? Yes, I very much do. Um, it's uh, Asian Top Gear. <laughs> We, I'm sorry, I, there we go. Oh my goodness, that, that actually is my favorite moment where, and this was improvised, um, I was asked to show the car by my husband to the presenter. So not only does my husband stop me walking in front of him, even the presenter stops me walking in front of him. And I think we had to do that because they, they liked it so much. We did that take about 400 times. It's such a great scene. Uh, the funny. show's amazing. It was full of killer one-liners. Do you have a favourite one-liner from the show? Um, well, there was a character we created that was loosely based on my mum called Mrs. I Can Make It At Home For Nothing, Mrs. Ikmia. Um, and her favourite catchphrase was literally that, I can make it at home for nothing, all I need is a small aubergine. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what, we actually, yeah, let's have a little look, we've got a clip of that, I think, let's have a little look. Oh, no. I love you long time. <laughs> okay, kids, get your coats, we're leaving. OK, fine. Go. See if I get. I don't need anybody. I don't need any family. All I need are three small aubergines. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Really funny. It's, so, it's such a joy. Everyone's going to absolutely love it. Yeah. Aren't they? Nina, thanks so much for your time. Have a lovely weekend. No worries. Goodness you gracious me. Bye. Sunday at 9.30 p.m. on... BBC Two. Well well done. Done. Thank you. Uh, finally, we cannot forget the classic comedy series The Office. Let's have a sneaky peek at a clip from this Sunday's episode. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I boys. mean, okay, yes. it's so iconic. The problem is, though, and there's some facts here, it's older than Facebook Office oh, now. It's, 20, it's, it's 23 years old. Really? But it's so iconic that David yeah. Brent. Mm -hmm. You know, who is Ricky Gervais and both of the way around. You do that dance. I'm sure we've all done it on the dance floor at some point. We should have oh. it on Strictly Fitness next week, maybe. Could we you could do it? I mean, that it, would maybe. be... You'll see it in a pass or later. <laughs> that would be amazing. The other thing is, they only ever made 14 episodes. You know, these great these great yeah. comedies, they never made many episodes. 40 Four, Towers. Yeah, yeah 40 yeah. Towers. They never made many episodes. Just 14. It was so big that it got picked up by the US. There's the US office. Um, you can watch The Office Sunday night, 9pm, on BBC Two. And talking of great shows, actually, on BBC Two, one of the great ones is Between the Covers, Oh, Sarah. excellent point. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah, lovely. It's coming back in the autumn. Cannot wait. I've already got given, actually, one of the books Absolutely because it's such so a whopper, but it's supposed to be the best book ever, so oh, I'm going to start that. I've got it with me, actually. I'm going to start it today. What a great team. Is it, yes. is it like an analogue? It's an analog book. A proper book. A yeah. real book. And it's a separate big. bag for it. It's more yeah, of a caution big. than a book. It's that big. It's like, <laughs> whack. Uh, can't wait. Oh, Jay, lovely that to see you. Lovely to see you as well. This is going to be great, isn't it? Happy birthday, BBC Two. There's tons of programmes and um, musical specials coming up this weekend, which will be available on both BBC Two 
and iPlayer. Uh, one huge hit that started life on BBC Two actually is Quiz Show Pointless. Creator Richard Osman starred for 13 years before shutting that iconic laptop in 2022, but continues to present uh, BBC Two's House of Games. Yeah, but it's not just his quiz expertise that's loved. His best-selling crime novels have gripped the nation too. We're looking back at when presenter Angela Rippon found out where he gets his murder mystery inspiration from. The towns and countryside of Sussex and Kent have inspired a man who's best known for shows like Pointless and House of Games to create a best-selling murder crime series, The Thursday Murder Club. Written by Richard Osman, the novel went on to become the fastest-selling adult debut crime novel ever. But where does Richard get his inspiration? <laughs> Richard grew up in the West Sussex town of Haywards Heath, so that's where we're meeting. You really don't think about um, Haywards Heath as being a centre for murder, and no. yet the Thursday Murder Club managed to dig them up regularly. This beautiful little English country villages where you imagine nothing wrong could happen and everyone's being murdered all the time. I come from a family of, uh, of very funny, very strong women, uh, of, of, of very tough but very kind men, and that's sort of what I try and represent in the books. I try and represent a version of Britishness that is about justice, is about kindness, and is about strength. Uh, and yeah, it all it all comes from here for me. So I think we should go to the retirement village now because that really is where the, the heart, heart of, of your thing. stories are. Yeah, let's go see if there are any bodies. <laughs> Richard is taking me to a retirement village which not only influenced Cooper's chase in his books, but is also home to his mum, Brenda. Did you feel that he'd invaded your, your space? <laughs> Everyone here has been wonderful. They've just been interested. I think my mum was worried reading the first book that I would have taken one of her neighbours and made them murder another one of her neighbours. <laughs> I, I, I had to reassure her that I was using my imagination. I have really been impressed by the fact that what you've done is established that people who come to live in a retirement village like this do have a wealth of knowledge and experience and expertise. Absolutely. Yes, because in our heads, none of us are older than 35, and that's how we see the world. Yeah. When he was a little boy, did, did he show any aptitude at all for writing stories or having an interest in what was going on around him? He was always writing something. Mm -hmm. And storytelling sort of goes in the family. My dad was always telling stories. And you just liked any sort of book. Yeah. I used to love I used to love the famous five. Oh. They were my absolute favourite. Yeah. Thursday Murder Club is the famous five for an older generation. Yes. Do you know, I never thought. They've even got a dog now. <laughs> Richard hasn't just set his books here. Its residents have also been a rich source of material. I look around, I sort of feel the characters within the place, and then, of course, you talk to everyone here again, and you're filled up once more as they, as they, they sort of give you plots for murders and say, there's, oh, yeah, there's, there's a high balcony in the, in the concert hall, and uh, <laughs> I wonder if you could push someone off there. And you're like, mm, this, is, this is good. And the llamas? There's llamas, there are water buffalo. I put the llamas in the first book, and people go, this guy, he's got a great imagination. I think, oh, no, they're there. There really, there really are llamas here. The last stop on our tour is an antique shop in Brighton, where Richard spent his teenage years exploring the different sides of the town. Brighton looks very genteel. My grandfather was a police officer in Brighton for many, many years. It is not genteel. Uh, and he would always tell me stories about the antique shops. And so I love that idea of this sort of objects everywhere, but also dodgy people wandering in and wandering out uh, and seeing the dark underside, what's actually going on underneath the surface. This is, for the moment, the last book in the series. I've done four. I think that people that agree that I really put them through the ringer in this one. Yeah, you're so going to allow them to retire for a little while. I'll give them a year just to rest and recuperate. Yeah. Uh, and then, and then we, we might have another murder for them. It has been such a delight to share Richard's memories of his childhood and the way in which the, the landscape of that childhood has been the inspiration for his incredibly successful series of books about the Thursday Murder Club. I tell you what, I don't think I shall ever look at a retirement village in quite the same way again. It's quite like going in West Sussex when Richard Osman's about. That's all yes. I say, yeah. And I don't know why she's talking about retirement villages. Oh. She's never going to retire, is she? Ever. The woman's an absolute... Quite right. Yeah. She's amazing. Incredible. The paperback of Richard's latest book, The Last a Devil to Die, will be available from the 9th of May. 
Now, what enjoys an occasional drink, smells quite floral, floral and would brighten up any lady's back room? No, not Gethin. I'm talking about, sorry, houseplants. Marvellous Mark Lane is back with some more gorgeous greenery. Hi, Mark. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, I've been here all morning looking at the amazing gardens and the exhibits. Now, earlier we met Amanda Grimes, garden designer, who taught us all about successional planting for our outdoor spaces. Now we're going to bring it all indoors with houseplants. And I'm here at the Happy Houseplants exhibit done by Grow Tropicals. And if we go over here, we can meet founder and director Jacob James. Hello, Jacob. Hi there, you're right. You're very good, thank you. Tell me, what is this exhibit all about? Yeah, so with the Happy Houseplants feature, um, what we've tried to do is demystify houseplants. We hear a lot of people saying, you know, I love houseplants, but I kill them. So what we've done is we've broken it down into three sections. We've got the kind of sun-loving section, so for people who've got self-facing houses or conservatories, the shade-loving section, which might be perfect for uh, people with maybe a dark office or a north-facing house. And then we've got this thirsty plant section, which is for plants that will thrive in kind of a moisture, a high moisture environment, so maybe a bathroom or a kitchen. Yeah. Um, and yeah, just really trying to break it down and make it as easy as possible to find the right plant for the right place. Because that's what you want to do, isn't it? You want to really make it easy for people because normally when people buy plants, they get those little labels on, they look at the back, and the instructions aren't always that clear, are they? So they can be tricky. Yeah, so I think a lot of plants, when you get the small labels from the nursery, it's got quite generic information. So we've tried to go a little bit more in depth with each of these plants. So there's keys that explain like how much light, how much water, if it's pet friendly, it's obviously important if you've got pets in the house, yeah. uh, even if they're edible. So we've got some edible plants. Uh, and then there's also kind of QR codes and things for people to get more information if they want it. Amazing. So if you're a dab hand and you know you grow your house plants and it's very, very good, what's new and exciting for this year that people could be growing? Yeah, so I think, um, Particularly uh, larger foliage plants with kind of dark velvety foliage is yeah. really popular at Gorgeous. the moment. Kind of anthuriums, philodendrons. Yep. Um, and then we've also got kind of more variegated plants. So like this stromanthi, um, which has got obviously the, the beautiful cream and pink yep. and then the red backs on the leaves. Uh, they've also been really popular. It's interesting, isn't it? Because I mean, you've got a monstera there. Now, a lot of people would just stick that right in the sun and sort of forget about it. But actually, it needs a lot of moisture, doesn't it? Yeah, so I think particularly the variegated variety, because yeah. it's got less uh, green in the leaves, less chlorophyll to take the light. Yeah. Uh, it does need a bright spot, but also it benefits from a bit extra humidity to really help the plant thrive. Amazing. Thank you so much, Jacob. That's been absolutely brilliant. Now, you've all been sending in your gardening questions, so it's about time that I answer them. I think that's about right, actually. Aren't those plants just beautiful yeah, in gorgeous. colour as well? Yeah. Uh, lots of questions here for you, Mark. Uh, Olivia, um, which plants are best if you have pets? Very good question. Well, there's a lovely plant for outdoors which you can do, which is Nepeta. Really lovely. It's also known as the cat mint. Cats absolutely love it. But I would also say you also need to be careful and not have some plants that can be really, really bad for pets. So I'm just leaning down, and there's this lovely... Stromanthi that we just saw earlier. This is absolutely brilliant. It's pet friendly. You can have it in your house. You've got those gorgeous colours. Absolutely stunning. So there you go, Olivia. Some really nice plants for you to have in your house and garden. That's a gorgeous one. So Rachel asks, Mark, do the apps which supposedly show you how much light there is in different parts of the home, do they actually work? Are they any good? It's tricky because you really need to understand about light levels. But what I would say is if you can find one of the phone apps that is about plant care, especially one that has light meters within it, then it just makes it that little bit easier to understand. And that way you can then enjoy your plants with the right light levels. Uh, I keep getting little flies in my indoor plants, says Sylvia. It's driving me insane, says Sylvia. How can I get rid of them, please, says Sylvia. <laughs> oh, Sylvia, I'm so sorry. Yeah, they really, really are annoying. We mentioned on Morning Live before, you can use coffee grounds, just put them onto the top. They don't particularly like those. You can also wrap sellotape around your hands with the sticky side out and just rub your hand over the soil. But what you can also do is top your pots with coir. Those little flies absolutely hate coir. So that's another way of keeping them away, Sylvia. So best of luck. Mark, what is coir, please? Koya, so it's a byproduct of the food industry. It comes from the coconut. 
So it's those coconut husks that are then all ground up and then they're sold as koya. Oh, every day's a school day. Now then, Mark, Carla sent us this question just for you. Have a look. I've just planted some perennial wallflowers and I was wondering what other plants can be planted with them to keep the colour going throughout the summer. Ooh. Yeah, that's a really lovely question. These are beautiful, these perennial wallflowers. I would say add things like perennials, things like in echinaceas or helleniums. They will be stunning because they will flower throughout the whole of the summer and then complement the colours of those wonderful wallflowers. Thanks, Mark. Uh, thanks for answering the questions. Have a lovely day there just down the road from us. We'll see you soon. See you Monday, I think. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Top man. See you soon. Uh, the questions keep coming. Uh, this one for you, uh, Nick. You're talking about scams today. Julie, I had a phone call from someone claiming to be my credit card fraud department. They knew the last four numbers on my card, my email address and postcode. How could they have so many details about me already? And what should I do? I suspect that, unfortunately, her, her data will have been lost by some company that she's given it to as part of a data leak or something like that. And if she's got a call like that coming out of the blue, it probably wasn't her bank. She should contact her bank's real fraud department uh, on the number on the back of her card or by dialing 159 and just tell them about this and essentially ask for a new card, maybe even new accounts to be set up, because that is obviously very worrying. Yeah, thank you, Nick. Thanks to all our experts today. Uh, time for a bit of Strictly. Uh, now it's time to put the puzzle uh, together. Uh, cue the music. Maria. Ooh. Maria. All right, let's do it then. Uh, let's remind ourselves of what we've been learning all week. Exactly. Now let's look at Monday. We had our stomp from Joe and Diane's routine. That is the movie that we're going to be doing right now. Then we had our butterfly arms from Helen and Gorka's routine. We had our sweep or our swoosh with that skirt with Ellie and Vito. And we finished off with that arm loop from John and Johannes. Shall we do a very, very quick reminder of how it was? Yes. Now, feet together. We're going to stomp, hand on the hip. Good. And we're going to create an eight figure with our arms. So that is the first one. Then we're going to go to butterfly hands. We're going to cross the hands and we're going to loop forward, bringing the wrists in and in. And we're going to do it to the other side. Excellent. Then we had our sweep, our swoosh. Imagine that you're holding your big skirt and you're flowing from side to side. Good. And then we had our arm circles. We're going to extend, palm up, low, all the way up. And we're going to change to the other side. Extend down all the way up. Excellent. Oh, gee, you look like a giant. Over. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, Don't come take next it away, to me. Alan. <laughs> With a fun Friday workout, it's Maria Tietjan. Ready? We're going to stomp. And nice song to finish the week. <laughs> Good. Let's go for our butterfly hands. And we cross. Bring them in. Good. To the other side. Cross. Just bring a them in. To <laughs> yes, very fast. <laughs> Let's go for our skirts. And imagine you have your big skirt. Yeah, have fun with it. Good. Turn the torso. Swing the arms. Good. And we go for our extended loop. And extend. Big arms. And to the other side. And one more. Very good coordination. I'm so proud. Let's go from the stop. And stop. 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 Really well. That's it's incredible. Good this one. See, we worked hard all week. Pays off. Let's go for our <laughs> butterfly to end. You look like you're on your horse. <laughs> and cross arms. Good. And let's go for our skirt. Oh, big that's swoosh. It. That's what we can talk about. Thanks for watching this. But we'll be back on 9:30. I'll be with Helen Skelton. Have a lovely weekend. Stay safe. Bye.